Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of your screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. I have a number of new subscribers in the past couple of weeks, so I'd like to say welcome to my Casual Friday podcast. On Tuesdays, every other Tuesday, I upload a technique video. So that's a different type of video than the one you are going to see today, which is just a review of my knitting life in the past week. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits. I have updates on two vintage sweater projects that I've been working on. I have some yarn that I got that is getting me really excited about knitting some t socks toe up rather than cuff down. And I have an update on my spinning breed study. So let's get started. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that if you are leaving a link down in the comments to something that you'd like to share, that's totally fine. But just be aware that if it's a link to an external website, YouTube is very often just deleting those comments immediately. It's not me doing it, um, it's them doing it. If it's a link to a YouTube video, that tends to be okay. But just be aware that if you see uh, that your comment has been instantly deleted, try leaving it again and just give an indication of what to search for and what words to use rather than trying to leave a direct link. This next tidbit came to me across my Twitter feed, I believe. It is a keyboard, a textile keyboard that has come out of MIT. Um, and it's kind of interesting. I'll link to uh, an article about this keyboard and there's a little uh, video that kind of shows what it is. It's a combination of being able to make music by touching the keyboard, but also just through proximity, similarly, similar to a theremin. If you've ever seen one of those, it's, a, it's this electromagnetic device where your hands can can go near it and it makes these weird sounds. You'll hear that in like old horror movies and stuff. You'll see, you'll hear theremin music sometimes. So this textile keyboard is a combination of proximity and contact. Contact. So I thought it was kind of interesting and I'll leave that link down below. This next tidbit came to me across my social media feed, probably Twitter and or Instagram. And it's, it's Textiles Reframed. It's a free program that you have to register for through Eventbrite. It's on the 25th of July at 2 p.m. UK time, which is 8 a.m. here in the US in Central Daylight Time. So you'll have to figure out uh, what time that would be in your time zone. But it's this 19th century dress and textiles reframed at home, a meet and greet short talks celebrating the joy of research. Uh, I gave you guys a, information about one of these a month or a couple of months ago, maybe. So this is a new one. And the Jill Salen will speak about creating corsets, 19th century patterns and techniques. And Tony Rutherford will discuss expectations and realities of 19th century costume working with 21st century bodies. So you need to register through Eventbrite, but again, it's a free program. Um, so I will leave the link to the Eventbrite registration uh, down in the show notes. This next tidbit came to me from a knitter named Scott who found my YouTube channel and then realized that we both lived in Minneapolis and then I introduced him to the Minnesota Knitters Guild. And so we've become friendly since that, since that time. He sent me a link to the cover of a new book that's coming out and I'll put the pic cover picture right here. It's called Designing Knitted Textiles and it's, it's about machine knitting by Florence Sperling. So she's a designer. She does design for hand knitting, but also um, teaches and designs uh, for machine knitting. 
And so this book guides readers through the fundamental skills of machine knitting while encouraging them to be creative and experimental. It takes a contemporary approach, exploring the countless possibilities of machine knitted textiles within multiple fashion contexts. So I just found, uh, and so did Scott, this cover image was really fascinating. To me, my first question was, what kind of a knitting machine could create something that was that chunky? And the next thing was, what happens when she moves out of that pose? Um, you know, it's interesting to look at in an artistic standpoint, but I'd be really interested um, to see what else she has to say about uh, designing the textiles. So if that's something that's of interest to you, I will leave links down uh, below to, it's an Amazon link to the book, which I think is still on pre-order, uh, but also to her Instagram account account. Um, so you might um, see more things from her that way as well. Earlier this year, one of my viewers told me about a YouTube channel called Just Get It Done Quilts. And it, this is at a time when I was getting back into sewing. I was trying to figure out how I could bring my sewing into this office that I have here and not have it set up permanently, but be able to store things in my closet. And um, I think it was at least one, if not two people told me about Karen's channel, Just Get It Done Quilts. She had a really great series on how to set up a sewing area in tight spaces that I found really, really valuable. So I subscribed to her since then, and she she does a variety of things on her channel. Sometimes she just has interviews with other quilters and designers and people who also have YouTube channels. And the one this past week caught my eye. It was a color deficiency with the colorblind quilter. So the colorblind quilter is a guy out of, I think he's outside of Edinburgh, um, Scotland. And he got into quilting. He didn't realize he was colorblind, I don't think, until he was an adult. No, he, he knew when he was a child, but um, it didn't seem like it really affected him that much until he was trying to get into quilting. As you may or may not know, I have some color vision deficiency. I, I can absolutely see red and green, but those are two colors that I do have trouble with when they're, they are dark or there's gray in them, it's, it's something like that. I, there's certain shades of those colors that I tend to know I'm not seeing correctly. And then if certain things are very pale that maybe contain a little pink or um, a little green, I may not notice that they have any color to them at all. So um, I didn't really realize until I was an adult how often my color vision was was affected. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I just you're oblivious to it. <clears throat> I was just oblivious to it. There were certain colors I didn't like because I thought they were ugly. Um, so I often knit with uh, texture. So I knit cables. I often knit with solid color. Uh, I will knit with self-striping yarn because the colors are chosen for me. I like bright colors, but I am a little intimidated, quite a bit intimidated, I should say, about trying to select more than two or three colors. Um, and knowing that they are going to go together. So I just don't have much practice with it. So I found this interview to be really interesting. And if you know someone who is colorblind or if you're colorblind yourself or have some color vision deficiencies, which is really the term, um, you might be interested in that. I'll leave a link down in the show notes. This last tidbit came to me in my Twitter and Instagram feed from Fleece to Fashion. I am often sharing things that uh, come across uh, my feed from them. And this one is a painting from depicting some women in the 1920s who are at the seaside. And the caption that Fleece to Fashion uh, wrote said, despite these ladies looking so stylish, I'm not sure if I would knit at the beach, especially with my yarn in the sand. Any bold beach knitters out there? Uh, I have knit at the beach a couple of times, usually a sock because that's small and it's not it's not big and it's not heavy. It's not going to be too hot. Um, but I haven't uh, knit terribly often. But that comment did remind me of an article I had read a couple of years ago when I was first researching antique and vintage knitting uh, sweater patterns that were published in the newspapers. So there was an article published in 1897. It was a reprint of an article that had appeared in Harper's Bazaar. 
and this was a time when sweaters, which meant something that you wore when you were sweating, it was like an athletic garment, definitely an athletic garment in the 1890s. Uh, and so team sports were becoming popular. And so sweaters were a relatively new garment back then. And the comment in the article was how the fad of knitting sweaters had been super popular at the seaside at all of the popular resorts the, the previous year than anyone who knew how to knit uh, was knitting a sweater. So I thought there were a couple of interesting things about that article. First of all, it implied that not everyone knew how to knit because there's this often there's this conception that everybody knew how to knit back then that they were all expert knitters and it was clearly not true. Not everybody knew how to knit. Um, and secondly, this was something people were doing as a leisure activity. It wasn't because they had to clothe their family. First of all, they're on a vacation at a seaside resort. And secondly, they are knitting a sweater that's going to be used as an athletic garment, um, which shows they also have some free time. So to me, it just gave an interesting way of looking at what sweaters were being used for and who is wearing them at this time and who is knitting them and what their social class might have been. It was a real change from what I thought I knew about uh, knitters and sweaters and all that sort of thing um, previously. So last week I was telling you that I had spun the first ounce of fiber in this breed study. I bought this kit from Wool Gatherings uh, on Etsy. It has one ounce of 30 different wool breeds. It's all combed top. So in some cases, if I'm going to be spinning a particular way, I might need to run the wool through my drum carter to kind of disorganize the fibers. In other cases, I can just spin the fiber uh, directly out of the little plastic envelope it came in. So last week I had spun my Cheviot and I needed to ply it. And then this week I wanted to, to spin, oh, what is it called? It is called Charolais, Charolais. It looks like a French spelling. I had not heard of this particular breed before. I have been using Fiber Love Diaries breed study. She did this, she's been a spinner for 13, 14 years, so she knows an awful lot more about spinning than I know. And so I've just been looking at what she did when she went through this breed study and just doing what she did. So I don't have to make those decisions because my goal in this breed study is yes, to try different wool breeds, but really to small, try small quantities of yarns or of wools that might need different preparations or spinning methods and just put the practice in. And all I'm planning to do with these is to spin them, to ply them, to knit them into swatches, that I can then sew into like a reference blanket that I will label. Somebody recommended in the comments that I might want to do like two swatches and try felting. See what happens if I try felting the swatch. She mentioned in particular that the Cheviot that she has doesn't felt so that it's sort of naturally machine washable. There's, there's enough yarn to knit a sizable swatch so that I will have enough to do two swatches, one to experiment on, one to put in the blanket. I'm going to go to an overhead to show you, I'm not happy with my, the yarn that I made with the Cheviot. Part of it is I don't like two ply yarns. I just don't like the way they look. I don't knit with them. The kinds of things I knit tend to need or want a three or four ply yarn, which is rounder. So I just don't like two ply yarn. Even if it's commercially milled, I don't tend to like it. So one, the, the thing that I learned out of this first experiment was maybe I need to do a three ply instead of a two ply yarn. So I haven't knit that one up. I think it's too loosely plied. And uh, you know, I was just experimenting with how to ply from a center pole ball and I hadn't done that before. And I, I just don't think that I was um, pl uh, putting enough twists in my ply. And there were also some issues with the center pole, I think, adding twist to one of the tails and removing twist from the other. 
Um, or it could just be that I don't like the wool or that my singles were bad. I don't know. It was the first one. So I will try to, to, to do something with that particular yarn um, to improve it if I can. And then uh, I have I have spun the Charolais and I just haven't applied it yet. So I'll be doing that this weekend. So I'm a little bit behind on what I would, what I kind of want to get done with that this week. Um, but I'm making progress, which is really all I ever want um, to, to do. Well, this is my Cheviot or Cheviot uh, yarn that I plied with using a center pull ball last week. And I think it's under plied and I, I hate this yarn. I'm going to I'm going to try plying it more. I think part of the, the problem with this yarn also is by using a center pull ball. One of the, the the single one end of the single is coming off the inside and one is coming off the outside of the ball, which means it's twi giving more twist to one of the ends and it's untwisting the other. And then I underplied it. So I'm going to see if if running it through my wheel again and giving it some more twists will change my mind before I try knitting it into something. I, you know, and I'm just, you know, my skills are pretty rudimentary at this point. I'm not by any stretch trying to be a technical spinner at this point. I'm just trying to actually get through each ounce of the wool and then turn it into yarn and then do something with it. And hopefully during the process of doing this over and over with the different wools, I'll get better. This was this week's uh, wool. It is Char Charolais, Charol something, I'll put it on the screen. So this one, I ran through my drum carter once just to disorganize the fibers a little bit. And then I did a, a long draw. I am going to probably chain ply this to get a three ply. The whole process, reason for doing this breed study is not just to explore different breeds of wool but also to get better at spinning and doing different fiber preps and different spinning processes and just getting better and that's going to take practice. One of my big goals for this year was to learn to knit toe up socks without hating it because I really love knitting socks and I prefer cuff down. So my goal was to, you know, find techniques that maybe could only be done toe up or find situations of very, for specific socks that I really wanted to knit that really would require them to be knit toe up. The advantages that people often cite like, well, you can try them on as you go. You can try cuff down on as you go. That's what I'm doing the entire time I'm knitting a sock. It's, it's not unique to toe up sock knitting. Using up all of the yarn has never been a desire of mine. I routinely have 25 grams left of a 100 gram ball. I tend to use sock yarn that has high yardage in it, like 460 yards, not 400. So I've never worried about running out of sock yarn and I've never wanted to use all of it because I typically didn't want socks that would be as long as a sock would need to be <laughs> in order for me to use up all of the yarn. And in fact, if I wanted to use it all up, I would have to calculate some calf shaping because it would just go up too far on my leg. So these have never been anything that appealed to me like that process. So I have been looking for techniques that were unique to toe up socks um, and techniques that appeal to me um, that would be interesting to knit. Um, there are plenty of heels that can be knit in either direction. So that doesn't like, that's not a reason to knit it toe up because I can do it cuff down. So I'm looking for things, you know, that are very specific and that would make me want to knit a sock, like a specific sock toe up. Our guild has these social uh, knitting groups that I've been a part of since the beginning of the year. And our Thursday night group, there were a couple of, of people that told me about this sock yarn that absolutely you'd want to use the entire skein because the colorway doesn't repeat. It's, it's a colorway that represents the solar system. So you'd want to start at the toe and you'd want to continue through the entire solar system. And that appealed to me on so many levels. 
like the whole geeky thing about the solar system. So I, uh, I looked into that and then my in-person uh, knitting group that meets at the park on Wednesdays, somebody else was knitting a really cool sock from an independent uh, dye co dyer company. And I went and visited their website and totally love what they are doing as well. So I'm going to go to the overhead. I'm going to show you the yarn that I bought from these two different independent dyers. One is called Gage Dye Works and the other is called Brenda and Heather. Gage Dye Works is in Canada and Brenda and Heather are out of Indiana here in the US. So let's go to the overhead and I can show you the sock yarn that has me wanting to knit some socks toe up. This is the yarn that I got from Gage Dye Works. Their labels indicate what type of yarn this is that it was dyed for. So this says classic. So they have a little postcard that comes with there and a classic yarn is one that's dyed like traditional self-striping uh, sock yarn. But they have other types of yarns that they dye in ways that are meant to be uh, knit with sweaters or shawls, which I thought was really interesting. So this colorway actually comes in two different repeats. One of them is called One Way Trip and that one is meant for like knitting a hat or something like this and it goes through the entire repeat of the solar system one time. And then they have another one that's called Round Trip that has two repeats of the colorway um, and that's meant for socks. And so they have it represented on the label this way. So here's the Round Trip and so it's symmetrical and this point in the middle of the skein is where the yarn would be cut in order to divide it into two equal balls. And then all of this gray right here that's representing sort of the vast emptiness of space is meant to be used for the heel. So that the if you start at the toe, for example, you'd be starting with the sun and you'd be working all the way across the foot and then you could use this for the heel. And then so the, the colorway remains uh, continuous all the way up the leg. You don't interrupt it by uh, knitting some of the stripes into the heel. So I thought that was really interesting and that appeals to me quite a lot. This is, this is the reason that I have been looking for to knit socks toe up, like that would require toe up socks. And that would be to actually use all of the yarn um, maybe not all of the gray, depends how much is needed for the heel, but to actually use the entire trip through the solar system in one sock. This is a situation where I will likely need to do some calf shaping. In this case, I would want socks that long just because it would use all of the colorway. So I am looking forward to these socks. One of the cool things uh, about the skein of yarn is they, they send you a little tag that you can sew into your um, item that you knit. So it's the logo for Gage, and then this is the name of the colorway on there. So I thought uh, this is really cool. I'm really actually looking forward to knitting these toe-up socks. The other yarn that I bought from Independent Dyer was from um, Brenda and Heather, so Ba, so Brenda and Heather. And they, their yarn comes in two skeins and then if you get the coordinating mini skein for the heels, they get a third one. So these were, came in two separate little 50 gram skeins already. You don't have to uh, find the center for these. This is left over, they always dye extra for their sock club and this is left over from a previous sock club month called Geothermic Rainbow it really appealed to me. You have an option with their yarns to get a coordinating mini skein or not, but since this was the leftover, it was just what they had. So the sock club theme they've got going right now is impressionist paintings. So for June, it was Vincent van Gogh's Starry Night, and it's a beautiful colorway. This person in my Wednesday knitting group had this, had that colorway and the sock pattern that went with it was so cool. They were already sold out of that, but they, they do have August still on pre-order, which is um, Edward Munch's The Scream. So you can see what painting is inspiring the yarn. You don't know what the yarn's gonna look like or their sock pattern, um, but you can see what the colors are gonna be. And then October is going to be Monet, like a, 
one of his gardens, paintings, uh, impressionist paintings of a garden. Finished the knitting on my 1960s vintage sweater. It's not done. I still need to do <laughs> to do the seaming, but I did finish the sewing. Uh, the sweater was in a timeout for a couple of weeks after we got back from our road trip because I was concerned that there was an issue either with the gauge or my calculations for for the sleeves and I was just like sick to my stomach thinking about I might have to rip everything out so I just ignored it for a couple of weeks. Uh, so I went back and I looked looked and measured and everything actually is just fine. So I'm going to go to the overhead and just show you what I have and I will be sewing it up uh, over the sometime very soon. It's July. I'm not going to be wearing this thing anytime soon. Uh, but I do want to just get that thing off my plate. I was 102,000 stockinette stitches with a little bit of knit one pro one ribbing. And I, I knew it was going to be boring to knit. Um, but the yarn was vintage. It was from the era, which was exciting. And I really liked the way that the neckline was constructed and that, that fascinated me. So I started this project just knowing that I was going to get bored and I did, I got really bored, but we'll go to the overhead and you can see what I've got done. What I have here are all of the parts to my 1960s sweater. They need to be seamed together, um, but I have them all and I did manage to make full length sleeves. Uh, I, I made the cuffs a little bit shorter than I had originally planned, but the total sleeve length was long enough. If, uh, if I had made the sleeve cuffs the full 30 rounds I had planned, I don't know that I would have had enough um, for both sleeves. Um, so I do have this little bit remaining and I'm going to keep this. I have a little bin where I keep the leftovers, at least some leftovers of each sweater that I've been, that I've knit in the past few years. I've realized the utility of that. So I'm not going to use this to seam the sweater. I have another yarn that's close enough to this color that because of the seaming method I use, which is mattress stitch, you won't be able to see the seaming yarn. But at some point in the future, if I need some yarn to make a repair or something, uh, I will want to have this on hand. So uh, I do have the full length sleeves. This sleeve is, you know, it was steamed at one point, but I haven't done any blocking on this part of the sleeve here. Um, I don't know if, and I must have, I must have uh, steamed part of the sleeve and then when I knit the rest of it, it hasn't been blocked yet. So you can see the difference that a little bit of steam makes. When I finally seam everything together, the entire sweater will be soaked for a while and then I will lay it out flat for final blocking. So I have each each of these pieces. I have to, to seam the buttonhole band uh, and yoke onto the, the front. Each of these parts has to be done. Uh, so um, so here are all the parts. So I did finish the, the knitting. I'm really happy to have that done. <laughs> and uh, I will be seaming this together at some point in the very, very near future. So I like to show you guys the progress and lack of progress and the mistakes that I make in my projects. Uh, and it's not to, to show you that knitting is so hard and, and you have to be an expert in order to knit a sweater. It's not actually it at all. What I want to show you is that everybody makes mistakes, including somebody who is a master hand knitter, an alleged expert on knitting. I can question the decisions I make. I can question my gauge. I can make boneheaded mistakes. Um, but the, that's okay. And the issue is, well, how do I decide what actually went wrong? Did something go wrong? What went wrong? And what do I need to do to fix it? It doesn't always mean ripping everything out. Sometimes it means ripping out part of your work. Sometimes it means fixing it in other ways. So this 1950s sweater that I'm working on has been, it's, it's such a contrast to the 1960s. They're both mostly stockinette, but this 1950s sweater has some really interesting things going on with the construction 
and it's requiring me to um, keep track of a lot of things at one time, which I actually kind of like. I find it a challenge. It's one of the things that I use my spreadsheets for is to keep track of, okay, what do I have to do on this row versus this next row? Like, how am I juggling all this? How do I keep track of it? And so for me, that's kind of fun, but it can also be a little aggravating if I think I know what I'm doing. And then it turns out I make some really dumb mistakes. So I want to go to the overhead and show you where I am on my 1950s sweater and a couple of mistakes I made and why with one of them I ended up ripping out and the other one I'm going to do something different to fix that mistake. So this is the left front of the sweaters. I had this done last week so that this I steamed a little bit and blocked it out so it's it's holding its shape. Um, so this will be the button band. One of the challenges of this sweater, while it looks pretty simple, it's mostly stockinette, it's got a little garter stitch, stitch pattern. The challenge of this particular sweater is the way that this pocket is constructed was really interesting to me, but I added an additional level of difficulty, which was that I wanted to join the sides of these of the pocket to the lining as I was knitting this rather than um, knitting the, the, the parts separately and then seaming them together later. So that was an additional level of difficulty. Then I started working on the right front and this one <laughs> Has, has been quite a challenge. Oh, and there's one issue that I uh, found, realized when I was putting my markers in for the buttons. If you could see the little error right here, I when I was doing the beginning of the wrong side row where I was knitting this for the garter stitch, I knit one stitch extra. Um, so when you're, you're doing it on this side of the fabric, it's, it's hard to tell that you're doing something like that. And I didn't catch it on a right side row. This is, you know, right up at the upper chest area, right next to where a button is going to be. And to me, the eye is going to be drawn toward that. And so that is something I'm going to want to fix. A lot of times when I find an error, some little error in a stitch pattern after I have completed the piece, you know, so I've already bound off, done all the shaping, and I can't really ladder down at this point to fix this. I'd either have to rip it out or I have to do surgery. Oftentimes, I will choose not to do anything because there might be enough else going on in the fabric that it won't be noticeable. In this case, I think that that is noticeable and I'm going to fix it. So I do know what to do. I just haven't done this particular type of thing before. I will snip a stitch and pull that yarn out and fix that stitch and then regraft it. This is not something that could be duplicate stitched over because of the, the purl bump. If I had made a knit stitch instead of a purl stitch, I could have done duplicate stitch to create the purl stitch, but because this bump is on the surface, I can't hide it by duplicate stitching over the top. So in order to actually fix this, I do need to do some, some surgery. So this is a situation where my spreadsheets can be uh, really helpful when I am, I need it to keep track of like the first, when I, when I do, when I did the back of the sweater and I had to bind off uh, for the two underarms, I needed to, to knit the back until it was a particular length. I think it was 14 or 15 inches. And so I paid attention to what row numbers I was binding off on so that when I knit the next pieces, rather than knitting it to that same measurement, I knit it to the same number of rows. And that way, when I do the seaming, I can seam row for row all the way up. Everything will match. Everything will absolutely be the, the same size, the same length. This was a very, very quick for me to knit the left front. Then I started the right front and the instructions were not quite as explicit as with the left front. There were places that were absolutely different and so they spelled out those situations. 
Um, but the first thing that had to happen, and you can see this isn't blocked compared to this. You can see the, the difference in how the edge is pulling in here compared to the one that's lying flat here. I had to, on row 17, do a buttonhole. And then I was told to mark that particular location. So I marked that garter ridge right here. And then they wanted me to mark about half an inch from the top here and then, and then space out the other four buttons equally. And so I figured out how often I needed to do that. And that, so then I had to keep track of that so that when I was working that row on this part, I would do the buttonhole. So I had to keep track of that. And I was also juggling all of the pieces of the pocket at the same time. And, but the instructions were reversed. So there was a certain amount of you have to reverse some things. They did spell a few things out, but I had to keep track of that. Plus I had the added burden of joining, which was my choice to, to make that modification to join this as I was knitting. And at the same time, keep track of when, <laughs> when to do the buttonholes. So yesterday afternoon, I was almost completely done with this left uh, or the right front. I was up here at the equivalent of this part. I was binding off for the button uh, band, the buttonhole band, and I noticed that I wasn't as far along along the edge here as I should have been. And what had happened was I had marked how many rows I had worked, and I thought that I had a marker that was row 50. It was actually row 60. So I didn't bind off for the underarm, uh, I bound off 10 rows too late. So everything was off over here. So I ripped it back and started re-knitting that part of it during my uh, Zoom knitting group last night. And then I woke up this morning and I thought I should just count the number of stitches I have. I hadn't counted stitches since I'd cast on. And the number was off. And I was like, where, I, I had two extra stitches and I couldn't figure out where it was. I realized that there was a problem here that I had more stitches than I was supposed to. But it actually, there was something that went on right after here on the pocket and I, I couldn't see it. I could only keep ripping out until I could count that I had the number of stitches. There's something I did wrong in the pattern that I could not actually see until, I, and I still don't know exactly what I did. I had realized that it kind of had looked funny, but I just ignored that and kept going and, and said, oh, it's because I didn't, this isn't blocked yet, that's why it looks weird. I just kept giving myself excuses. So this morning I ripped all the way back to here, and then I've re-knitted up to here. So now I have four buttonholes and I have a few more rows and then it will be time uh, for the underarm bind up and I, I and I can continue. But this kind of thing happens. I usually expect one one boneheaded mistake every sweater or two. Uh, <laughs> it just, especially this one, it just, I think it was juggling too many things. It was keeping track of the pieces of the pocket and the fact that the shaping was opposite and I was joining it and I had to do the buttonholes and then I was I had made a mistake in keeping track of how many rows I'd worked and I hadn't counted my stitches. And so I neglected to do all of these things just because I felt like, well, I just did the left front and it worked just fine. And I, I just kept plowing through and ignoring every red flag that came along and not ever stopping to just count things and make sure that I was where I was supposed to be. So this will get finished probably tonight and then we'll see, then I'll have the two sleeves and the collar. So this is going pretty quickly aside from the part where I had to rip most of it out. I have a few things I'm, I'm juggling at the moment. So I want to just get some things off my plate and but before um, going forward any further. So I will get this part done and then we'll see uh, what happens with the sleeves. I might alternate a sleeve with a sock just to break up the monotony of having to do two sleeves in a row and two socks in a row. 
Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.